Charm, one of my properties listed here in the fine city of Atlanta, with the penthouse that I've told you guys about several times. But this time, out of all the guests I've ever had welcomed uh, here on this location, I am more, I can't say how extremely honored I am to have the man of the hour here at Southern Charm in Atlanta, Midtown, Mr. Armin Moore of the heist that shook a nation. Guys, listen, let me hear it. This is the crowd. Thank you. Very beautiful city. I'm honored. I didn't pay him to do that. I have to say that I really, really did. Thank you so much for that. The heist that shook a nation over seventy million dollars. You have been on this worldwide um, tour talking about this amazing book. Um, before we go any further, I want to thank Linda Thomas for making this interview happen. Thank you so much. She is here. Thank you so much. I'm honored. I'm excited. I'm curious. I'm all of those things and looking forward to this conversation with you. One of the things that I wanted to make sure we talked about is the man behind the story. story, right? Because there's a man behind this story. This story just didn't happen. I want to know who that man is. The, the son of a Southern preacher. The son of a Southern preacher, the <laughs> son of a former blues singer as well. Wow. Yeah, my father was uh, a blues singer back in the late 40s, 50s. Uh, he was named Mr. Beale Street in um, Memphis, Tennessee. Okay. There's a very large six-foot plaque of him on Beale Street. Uh, his name was Arnold Dwight Moore, but his stage name, we referred to him as Gatemouth Moore. Gatemouth. Yes. Okay. And uh, there's an interesting story how he got that name as well. But um, my father was even as a blues singer, even as a, um, uh, a pastor. My father's always been an extremely proud man. And a lot of that uh, transcended, trickled down to me. And my mother, I tell people all the time that my mother is the embodiment Tyler Perry's character, my dear, <laughs> minus the reefers, <laughs> but everything yeah. else, oh my God. And I always refer to myself as a civil rights baby okay. because I was born in 1954. And my father tells me all, told me all the time because he passed away in 2004, that I was born out of civilization because uh, my father had to do a radio show and they didn't have syndicated shows back then. So he had to go to Birmingham, Alabama to do the show. So he took my mother with him. She went into labor and gave birth to me there in right some place called uh, Inslee, Alabama, which was a suburb of Birmingham. I've never lived a day in my life in Alabama. <laughs> so they took, we all went back to Memphis and a lot of my life I spent in Memphis, but I spent more of my life in Chicago and in the uh, southern suburbs of Chicago. Uh, as a child, we moved around quite a bit. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, uh, New York. Uh, as an adult, I spent time in uh, <coughs> California and a few other places. So you're and not a stranger to moving around. That's not no, a problem, yeah? It's like a lot of people that I encountered uh, were born in the city and lived there their entire lives, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, they really saw nothing wrong with it because they, their mindset was, well, everything I need is right here, you know, which that wasn't necessarily the case, you know. Uh, I've always been a person who believed in broadening their horizons. The chairman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Explain to me the cherub. Um, one of my co-defendants, Ron Carson, actually, uh, uh, I don't want to say he gave me that name, but he used it quite a bit. But I had a company back in the 80s, American National Air Services and Investments Incorporated, and I was the chairman of the board of that. And so that kind of transcended okay. to everything else. And so he and quite a few others would call me the chairman. Mm -hmm. And um, that was one of the things that um, uh, myself and my writers were concerned about, but uh, concerning um, Frank Sinatra because he was the chairman of the board. And that's what they said. Well, that's, that's the thing. Even though you were the chairman of a board, but you're not billed the as chair. chairman of the board, mm -hmm. you're just the chairman. Mm -hmm. So that uh, th therein lies the difference and why they decided they wanted to uh, go with this. Speaking of book deal, how did this book come to be? We've all got, we all got stories, mm -hmm. right? Uh, your story, we're going to get a little bit into it, is not like any, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, oh my goodness. How did this happen, though? How did the fraud happen? Or how did the book no, the book. <laughs> how did the book happen? Like, how did you say, okay, I'm going to go through all of this. When I get out, I'm going to tell my story. Well, what actually happened while I was incarcerated, uh, we spent a numerable amount of time on lockdown. And one of the things that I did to um, keep a modicum of my sanity, uh, I actually did a lot of writing. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily, like you will read the um, uh, prologue, I think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, value of courage, persistence, and courage of there is mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and more convincingly than the life of Armin Devon Moore. Mm -hmm. The predecessor's a geisha's non familiarity that exudes a confidence that some may perceive as arrogance. My native not of powers of persuasion, characteristic authoritative manner, a very high level of intellect. I'm a polarizing figure. I actually shock most that send a primal message of alarm and fear throughout their bodies from a human perspective. My genesis colossi of Arthur Nash, an imperial swagger, has propelled me into the extraordinary and inspired me to greatness, touching an emotional core within me. I walk, nose up, with an overbearing air of self confidence, calculated to provoke. The maximum amount of injury and resentment. So, oh, and it goes on and on. I'm, not going to I, 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 I'm here. I'm, I'm literally trying to find out where you, literally, almost verbatim. I wrote it. I know, but how do you, is this something, It was this like an affirmation to you Why you were in lockup or? No, um, I've always had a fan. I can remember conversations with my mother that I had when I was five years old, just like they were yesterday. And wow. I'm 68 now. You know? Wow. I just, I could read something, and I don't mean like open up something, read it, and that's it. I would read it, you know, and mm -hmm. it would, uh, just like how I can read that. Yes. Uh, to be or not to be, that is the question, whether it's a noble in the mind to suffer the swings and arrows of outrageous fortunes, or to take to arms against a sea of trouble by opposing in them, to die to sleep no more. And by sleep, can we say that we will live a thousand natural shocks, plus you say, too, to a consolation for whatever it be wish. To die to sleep, to sleep, the chance to dream. Ah, there's the road. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we shuffled off this mortal coil? Let's give us pause. There's a calamity that makes kind of so our life on It's like Shakespeare. So if I see something that is of interest to me, I'll remember it. <laughs> <laughs> I Because you just did that. <laughs> My producer saying, next time you recite some shoes, you to look that Oh, bad. okay, fine. Because I'm sitting here like, you are a blessed man, first of all, to even have that type of memory. Let's not even talk about your age. Just period. That's not, I can't even remember. I couldn't even get y'all the right address. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you just quoted a novel. Wow, Mr. Moore, there are so many layers to you. The way that you're looking at me, I know that we will not get through all of these layers today. But one of the things I do want to say is, your father was a preacher. Yes, he was a blue singer than a preacher. 
Do you think some of that covering, the spiritual covering, the prayers, those type of things helped you through? Absolutely. Um, I'm a firm believer in God. Uh, I touch and read my Bible every single day. God kept me for 30 years and three months in federal prison. I got out nine months early as a direct result of Donald J. Trump because he signed the uh, First Step Act, which allowed me to get out earlier. I had previously gotten 18 or 19 inmates released from prison. And um, because as my hobby there, I did legal work. It was a point of contention with the staff because even when incident reports were written on the inmates and they were bogus, I would um, review the reports and use their own policy, which the vast majority of them didn't know, uh, against them. Of course you did. Of, of course. Of course. Yeah. Uh, 28 CFR, the Federal Code of Regulations, is the Bible for the uh, right. uh, <laughs> pure prisons. And um, wow. I slept with that under my pillow. Because when I first came into the system, they kept me in what comment is commonly referred to as the hole for two and a half years, where I was in isolation. And uh, I guess they thought that, that would make me less competent. They were wrong. It just afforded me more time for myself to absorb more things. Okay, so the heist. Okay. We can get over into the movie part. Okay. Yeah, we can talk about that too. Want to talk right. About we can talk about that. Give us high overview for the people that have not picked up their copies yet. Okay. You get this is on Amazon that have not picked their copies up yet. Um, Give them an overview of this book. An overview of the book, of the overview of the heist, uh, because there are a lot of other facets of the book that lead up to the heist, the parts of my life, and so forth. Um, I was a person who always believed that people don't have to settle, okay? Now, I want to clarify specifically what I'm saying. I'm not uh, telling anyone or encouraging anyone to go out and commit a crime to do something. I mean, you're a grown person, you do what you want to do. And this is not, people ask me, well, can I use this and do that? I wouldn't advise it. You're talking about something that took place in 1988. This is 2023. 20, Things have changed dramatically. Okay. But uh, one thing that has not changed, and one thing one of these reporters had written, that uh, technology is very advanced, but it's not advanced enough to detect the larceny of those who operate it. There are things like this that are just done on a different level every day. I had lunch with one of the vice presidents uh, from a bank in Detroit, I won't mention his name, before this was done. And I discussed this entire thing with him. And he said, if this takes place and goes off without a hitch, no one will ever hear about it because the banks don't want anyone to know that something like this happened. Okay? So um, as best as I possibly could, I tried to put as many fail safes in um, place. But the, the biggest uh, uh, problem was not the crime. The biggest problem was not the execution of it. It was the individuals who were involved in it. Uh, because uh, one of the bank employees, Gabriel Taylor, he, uh, these people, he and I met for lunch after this was done and the money was set. And he told me, well, the, the money's gone. It's gone, you know, it's gone, where it's on a Friday. And none of us, even myself, realizing that this was actually on a Friday the 13th. Wow. <laughs> so wow. But at any rate, um, the, the money was gone, it was sent, and um, uh, we had our lunch, we had our discussion, and so forth, and uh, everything was all right. What happened was some of the money that was taken actually overdrew some of the accounts. Which raised right? flags. Exactly. Because one transfer was nineteen million and five hundred thousand, one was twenty-four million and something was twenty seven other million, whatever. And if memory serves me correctly, uh, which I don't even know if these people are still in business, you're not yeah, yeah, they are. 
United Airlines, um, Brown Foreman Distilleries of Kentucky, and uh, the last one was, um, uh, I can't think of the name of it right now, but it'll come back to the list here. And um, what happened when the people started calling in about that, it set off alarms in the bank. And so, which of course, they contacted the FBI, which I had a conversation with David Palin before any of this has even done. I said, if something happens, you don't know nothing about nothing, you're just simply doing your job. Because the way that this worked, when a person called in to make a wire transfer, they'd give the order to the person who answered the phone. Mm -hmm. Then they would pass this order off to the person sitting next to them. And then they would call to verify the order. So every time we called it, every time I called it to make a transfer, mm -hmm. we would wait till the young lady was on the phone, we'd give the order, and she'd pass it off to Gabriel Taylor, our guy, and who would call the number we already had set up. I see. We knew we were when he was calling, who he was calling for, the phone would be answered in that name. Remember cell phones, phone ID, how yeah, to nice. exist. Yeah. And uh, that's how the money was sent. Okay? So what happened is when things started to unravel, Gabriel Taylor told him everything that he knew, but which of course he didn't know everything, but he just knew enough to do everything. Because I had told him, look, I can get you out of trouble. You can't get me out of trouble. So, but um, he um, wore a body wire on his other friend who worked at the bank, Otis Wilson, who recorded him. He never recorded me on the body wire because I never came in contact with him after that. Not because I knew something was wrong, it's just the fact that there was no reason to you, yeah. you know, to talk with him. So um, two of the wire transfers were immediately sent back to First National Bank of Chicago. The third wire transfer, which had 19 million, 500,000, I think, in it, uh, the bank refused to send it back, you know? Okay. So the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, contacted the State Department and asked them to intervene with the Austrian authorities because they weren't trying to get that money back. Oh, because it was going to uh, a non-American bank. It's oh, going. yes. Yes. So let me ask you, I'm sh did you actually get away with any money? Or did it was all kind of... The, the last uh, 20 million uh, was gone for a couple, two, three weeks. Did you just say 20 million, 20 million like it was like $20? That's a lot. <laughs> Not by today's standards. True. Sure. <laughs> you yeah. could buy a $3 million car today. So yeah. You couldn't buy one back in 88. Yeah. But um, that account actually drew close to $50 million in it. I'm sorry, $50,000 in interest just because of the money sitting just over there. Sitting there. You know. And there was other money prior to this that was there. Okay. So it wasn't a thing that, hey, this is the first time I decided to do this or whatever, you know, this. A lot of people, and I guess there'd be no reason why we would, they uh, never understood the banking system. They don't understand it to this day, mm -hmm. okay? You have people in the bank, uh, loan officers, assistant vice presidents, presidents, and other people, that have, and they still do, what's known as loan limits. Okay. That means that they can give a loan to someone um, with no one else to say so in the bank. Okay? Okay. And um, as a matter of fact, there's an interesting story behind that. When I was at uh, FCI Mila in Mila, Michigan, uh, the guy that was my seller, his girlfriend had a friend that was an auditor in the bank. and. Um, an audit was coming up, and what happened was one of these assistant vice presidents had approved a $10 million loan for a friend of his to do some business stuff, whatever, mm -hmm. completely legitimate. Mm -hmm. And so, but the guy got behind in his payment, so the loan was outstanding. So he was telling me, I said, tell your girl to tell her, go to that guy, talk to him, say, well, Mr. So-and-so, you know, we've got this, and how would you like this handle? which of course she didn't do. She wrote it up and, you know, whatever, and put the guy on the spot. She ended up getting fired. He kept his job, you know, 
and uh, this that. Uh, if a person wanted to start a business or whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, whatever financial institution decides to lend them the money to do it, there's nothing that we do about that. And as long as you make the payments back on time, yes, so no, no one's going to ever even question it why it was done. In, uh, what was it, 88? I think it was. Oh, prior to that, 87. Uh, a guy that I knew had a 110 foot per hour yacht. And well, because, well, let me step back a little bit. In 77, I got a 41 foot uh, Chris Craft Commander. And uh, I learned at a very young age, my cousin's economist in Michigan City, Indiana, his name was James Gatska. And Mr. Gatska was an extremely intelligent man. Um, I heard something the other day. Uh, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're hanging out with the wrong group. I promise you. And so, um, just like another very good friend of mine, George H. Ruth, I learned a tremendous amount from him, but I'll, I'll get back to him later. And um, he said, you need a yacht. Okay, so I don't care about it. No, 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 you don't understand. Because it puts you in an arena that you not would normally not be in. You're exposed to people that you would normally not be exposed to. Uh, it's just like, uh, I was 23 years old when I got my first Rolls Royce. And he says, driving a Rolls Royce, and we're talking about uh, uh, 77. Um, it said a lot, of, just like it does today, it says a lot about you. Yeah, absolutely, it's a status guy, for sure. Exactly. And uh, back then, when you got the car, because I got it from California, and uh, I had uh, Flying the Tigers, which was a, 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 a cargo air charger thing, because I was in Detroit, but they brought the car to Chicago because they didn't go any further. So I went down there and picked it up, and I drove the car to Memphis. So going through Missouri, it was a convertible, but I had the top down. Nice. And uh, this cop got behind me and <laughs> pulled me over. And uh, he, you may not be old enough to remember this, the old Dodge Boys commercial, Big Belly Cop Car, where he had wire and glasses. Yeah. He walked to the, he went to the back of the car, went to the front of the car, came back to me, and uh, he said, who the hell are you, boy? Right. <laughs> you know, he said, are you one of them California rock and roll singers or something? He's <laughs> on the telephone, no. So it's like, he said, I sure bet this car cost a pretty penny. Yes, it did. So I uh, no, I just wanted to see the car. I know you've done nothing wrong. Okay, thank you. Give me up you go. Okay. A lot of times in my life, and I'm still learning right now, I never really realized. I knew that I had some type of anointment on me, yes. even growing up as a child, because my, my um, thought pattern was different. Mm -hmm. Uh, the things that I looked at in life were different. Just different. It was just different. Just different. Mm -hmm. You know, that uh, I always wanted a little bit more. Not to the point, you know, that I felt that I was better than someone or something like that. You know, it's just that I want something out of life. And I intend to get it. What made you do, what made you try something this big? I mean, that's yeah. Not that's not big? You have to understand, that was done through wire transfer. Billions of dollars of wire transfer daily uh, through the wire systems uh, of the world. That's not big. That's not big at all. You have people that spend $70 million on a house nowadays. But like I said, you would not have seen that in 88, but today you do. Come on, let's talk. Country boy from Alabama. Mm -hmm. You know. I'm assuming regular roots. I don't know. I'm not, you know, I don't know if you were, you know, did you come from money? Like, my father had far more financially than my mother had. They were separated. He was living in Chicago. In 1968, we moved out to uh, Markham, Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, we were like the second black family in the entire neighborhood. Okay. Everybody I went to school with, uh, with the exception of two or three kids, were Caucasian. Got you. Okay. And. Um, once again, this could be redundant. I'm not saying that made me any better 
-hmm. or worse than anyone else. Mm -hmm. But my mother, getting off on it a little bit, she was a, a, a real stickler for grammar and thing, you know, set up straight, mm -hmm. man, you don't say this, you say that, don't okay. come proper, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And that stuck with me all my life. Okay. okay. And it was obviously a help, but it was a hindrance as well. Uh, because till this very day, you know, I would talk to people and they would say, oh, you talk like you're white. Yeah. You know, and, <laughs> I talk uh, proper, thank you. Um, yeah. And actually, there's really no such thing as proper, it's correct. Anyway. It's correct. Right. But um, this is a little interesting thing. Um, a guy that I met in the system, uh, he was part of BMF. Oh, okay. And uh, he asked me to speak to the first lady of BMF, Juice. Okay. Uh, I think she was the one that the magazine Juicy was named after that Meech owned. And uh, Meech and I corresponded all the time. I have stuff on my phone, um, you know, from him. Matter of fact, I sent him a copy of that book. Nice. And uh, another friend of mine, he just got his copy uh, a day or two ago. And she and I had a very long business count. Well, it wasn't long because you only talked for 15 minutes. You had to hang up, wait an hour, and call back. Uh, about business because there were a few businesses and restaurant business and this and this and she was telling me how this does not blah 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 and so I explained everything to her but bear in mind she had never seen me in her life mm -hmm. and so the next day the other guy called her and she told him she said that white man called <laughs> and, uh, um, you know talk and stuff. but to, just passed away I think it was in 17 or 18 17. And um, her mother, they call her Mama Clay. Mama Clay and I still uh, speak at least once a week. Okay. And uh, this and that. As in my papers and stuff, I have a copy of her obituary. On my phone, I have uh, thank you, birthday cards and thank you cards from Juice. She had on there, Mr. Moore, thank you. I really appreciate all that, blah, blah, And thank you for being part of BMF. Okay. So, okay, yeah, okay. You know, uh, that was it. Uh, one of my very good friends uh, when I was in Kentucky um, was um, John Dunn's brother. We used to walk through the yard and stuff all the time. But the old saying is, uh, water like intelligence, it seeks its own level, you know. And that drew, uh, it was a point of contention for a lot of the black Indians. Who is always around the white folks, blah, blah, blah. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which I paid that absolutely. Yeah, no the at all. There, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, the higher you go up in security, the more uh, serious things are. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they had a situation one time where uh, the blacks were going to go against the whites because this white guy was going to stab this black guy because he owed him money for drugs for a year. And, he did, and they, come on, come on, aren't you going out here? No. No, I'm not going out there. You think I'm going to go out there and stab somebody or get stabbed or somebody has a drug deal? No. Now, normally, but before anything happened, the staff stopped the whole incident. My refusal could have possibly cost me either getting stabbed or my life or being told I had to leave the compound because I wouldn't participate in the thing. Because, you know, this is the mentality of most of these people. Believe it or not, you have people that are incarcerated that are not remotely concerned about going home. They're at home. You know, um, they don't look for, and it's not because they are in life sentences or this or that. A lot of these people are living better in prison than they 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 on the street. I'm going to segue to that. How did you mentally survive 30 years? in prison, and I'm assuming this was maximum security? Uh, no, what happened was this. I got transferred from federal institution to federal institution religiously. I received three transfers in nine months. Normally, you don't get transferred for four or five years, okay? okay. Uh, a few of the staff members that really stepped over the line, uh, they were forced into early retirement or something like that. And so I was, uh, a real thorn in their side. Okay. So what they would do is, well, what they did, 
they sent me to higher level security because they know just by you being there, uh, something's going to happen to you. And they don't have to do it. So they're the, same, they're the idiots that you're locked up with. I see. And so, you know, And nothing ever. Oh, yeah. You had some. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. Um, I got stabbed in my sleep. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but see, here's an interesting thing. As a direct result of doing legal work, I read a lot of stuff. And I can't remember what institution it was at. Uh, this, these two guards were working the SHU, SHU, Special Housing Unit, mm -hmm. AKA the hole. And uh, this food slot is down. They have a slot down there, you slide your tray and whatever else and they want to give you. And uh, the lady claimed that the inmate had grabbed their arm. Okay. And so what happened was they contacted the lieutenant and asked if this inmate could be moved to another cell. So the lieutenant agreed, whatever they tell them, that's what they're going to go with anyway. And um, they put him in the cell with a guy who obviously has some type of conflict with this guy. Okay. And what happened was the guy killed him in the cell. And so once this all came out, what happened, both those officers were prosecuted. The female got life, and the other guy got 10 years, 10 or 12 years, something like that, for violating this guy's civil rights by uh, setting his murder up. So, but uh, th that's what happened. Anyone that has a loved one, a friend, or anyone, and I'm speaking of the federal system right now, and I'm sure it probably is, so that's why I do prison advocacy. Their well-being is in jeopardy on a daily basis, and it doesn't necessarily have to come from the inmates. From the inmates yeah. I, I watched a guy in the unit next to me get stabbed. They took him to the hole, put him in a cell, and he died. They took him out, put him in an ambulance, took him to the hospital, and called his family and said that he died on the way, the way to the hospital. Wow. And th that's, those are not isolated incidents. You know, this is something. They, they, these people feel that... Uh, the inmates are indentured servants or slaves. Yeah. They can do whatever they want to. Yeah. Um, they can come, like someone like me, to write them up and stuff all the time. Uh, they get two or three of them to come in and go to certain guys' cells, and shake them down, and they go, well, we wouldn't be doing this if our more wasn't writing us up. Okay, wow. to try to, you know. Get them to go against you too. Exactly. And listen, so you would get repercussions exactly. from that. And so then they could say, well, we didn't do anything to them. Okay. How did this experience change your life? I'm clearly more well versed on corrections, <laughs> sometimes more of what I care to be. And um, it changed my life in a sense that. I was able to restore the life of 19, 18, 19 people. Wow. Now, what they did with that life once they got out there, yeah. that was entirely incumbent upon them. Yes. But, and I don't think you could give someone, and for someone, a person who's never been incarcerated, they hear the words 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, like in my case, and that's, and wow, that's a long time. You have no idea unless you've experienced it, period. That's why, like a person who uh, would talk to me about prison and prison, first thing I ask, you ever been in prison? Mm -hmm. Well, then you don't know anything about prison. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you saw on TV, I don't care what someone told you. That, now, let me really get off the subject real quick. <laughs> I, I equate that with what the courts do, what Congress does, and stuff con what concerning uh, a woman's rehabilitation, I'm, I mean, reproduction, reproduction um, issue. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, no man should have a single solitary word to say about abortion. Exactly. Or what a woman does. I totally agree. Totally agree. And so, no, you get back to the subject. Thank you. <laughs> but, um, uh, oh, I learned a lot. Yeah. Because as growing up, uh, and honestly, I looked at, through the world through those colored glasses, and I thought everybody was like me, a nice person, a kind person, a considerate person. People in prison used to tell me, you don't meet people like you in prison, you know? Yeah. And um, I understood what they, you know, what they meant. 
But like I said, this is gradually uh, coming upon it. I knew that there was always something there as far as something inside me. Mm -hmm. But I've been home. I got home in 19. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did a relocation package and went to uh, Arizona, Chandler. Is that where you met Karen? Karen, no, 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 no. Karen at the, um, at the hotel? Karen at the hotel. Unless you gave her another name. Which but that was a Karen at the hotel. You had, something happened with the Greyhound. I'm just trying to go off I, a lot of my head. Mm -hmm. I'm not like you. I can't remember anything. <laughs> um, but there, she was there at the front desk, and uh, she just welcomed you. You had a new phone. You were T-Mobile. You need to go get it activated. Oh, and you had no yes, idea yes, yes. about this. That was the actual <laughs> day that I was released from prison. Okay. And uh, a friend of mine uh, sent me some money mm -hmm. to come out. And that friend was uh, Timmy Peoples, uh, which you're probably unfamiliar with this, because uh, this is back from the 80s. YBI, Young Boys Incorporated. I'm too young. I'm too young. They were... <laughs> the big deals in town uh -huh. at that time. And his wife um, was the one that uh, entitled that book because we were trying to figure out. Um, um, uh, they came down to see me in uh, Arizona. And uh, what happened was she asked me, she said, uh, her name's Tanya, Tanya Peoples. There's a special little section written in there thanking her for that. Um, she said, what do you got to name the book? I said, well, entitled book. I said, we haven't really decided yet, but we were in the heist or something like that. I said, this, there was this one girl in, uh, this was back in the 70s, she always used to tell me I was one in a million. She said, well, no, why don't you name it uh, one in 70 million? Because of the 70 million that's taken back. So I liked it, my lawyers liked it, the uh, people that were assisting me in writing liked it, and so that's why we stuck with it. And uh, a couple of other individuals came on board, Mr. Eddie Allen and so forth, and he said, well, if we just have it, uh, one in 70 million, they, people may not generally know what that makes reference to. He said, well, let's do the heist one, uh, the trip to nation one in 70 million. And so that's what we ended up going with. And so that's how we have the uh, book now. $70 million seems like so much to regular folks like myself, okay? I know you said there's billions that move around. I get it. $70 million mm -hmm. that they say, because mm -hmm. there was a lot of contention back and forth in several of the chapters in terms of what you actually did versus what was actually said you did. Uh, there was a lot of that. It kind of went back and forth on that. So I'm like, I don't really know if he really did 70 million or did he? Actually, it was 69 million 750,000. <laughs> so it wasn't 70. <laughs> so it wasn't 70. Okay. <laughs> 250,000. I mean, that's, that's a big deal, right? Yeah. It just kind of went back and forth. So how did you, I don't know if you can get this far into it. Just mm -hmm. let me know if it's a, you know, no. Did you actually get caught or did somebody snitch? Like what kind of? Most of the people that are incarcerated, someone said something. Okay, these people, had no, the, when I say these people, mm -hmm. the feds had no idea who I was. Okay. It wasn't until Gabriel Taylor told them. Okay. And they went back in and checked my history. There had been, for decades, 200,000 year, 400,000 year, this, that, 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 that. Mm -hmm. And now, Mr. George Ruth, uh, George Ruth and I met in 86, I think it was, in Sandstone, Minnesota, at the prison there. And uh, we just kind of gravitated towards each other. You know, he knew what I had done at the time. And, uh, this was, he's a white guy. And uh, this was something, you know, when, and even to this very day, with a lot of white people, you know, say, wow, you did that? You know, you're supposed to stand on the street corner and sell nine rocks and run into a 7-Eleven on Saturday night special. Yes. You're not supposed yeah. to do anything like that. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I used to have people ask me, they'd see me drive up in my roles. Uh, How are you doing? It's a very lovely car. Uh, who owns that car? You know, wow. You know, I who are you parking it for? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. uh, they would always assume, yeah. you know. And... Um, 
when George came home and when I came home then, back in the 80s, um, George set up a $6 million line of credit for me, which enabled me to buy my Rolls Royces, my Jeeps, and a lot of other stuff. Um, until this very day, I spend a tremendous amount of money on my clothing. Okay. Oh, okay. If it's not tailor-made or designer, I don't put it on me. And that's from the socks when I have them on to anything else, okay? Because I feel that uh, I'm worthy of it, okay? And like my father used to say in church, it's a poor dog who don't wag his own tail. <laughs> so, I like that one. I like that one. Oh, I remember reading something. And let me see if I can get it correct. I didn't write this, but someone else wrote it, and it kind of stuck with me. Look at me. Um, yeah. <laughs> they didn't know what you carried, and they treated you like you were common. But God wanted them to treat you that way because he wanted you to see who they were. Because nothing exposes character more than the way you treat people you don't think you need. If you knew what I carried and what God was doing, you would have latched on. But God said, I'm going to hide you in plain sight so you can see who your real crew is and who the fake ones are. But uh, I heard that and it stuck with me. You know, and I remember that. And I, I, I can, you know, go back. In that book, it has God's angels who've been in my life. My mother's name is there. My stepmother's name is there. Uh, Sadie Alexander, Reverend Alexander's wife, he is the one that wrote the second foreword for that book. He's the pastor of Union Baptist Church in Chicago, Illinois. And they were like my other set of parents, okay? And still are to this very day. That's a blessing. Yes, it is. And um, uh, I lived in their home. They took care of me. Growing up, I was 20, 21, 2 years old. Um, I drove Reverend Alexander's Mercedes. I would drive the limousine. I'd drive the Cadillac and all this stuff. And so I was exposed to a lot, a lot of nice things. You know, and he never you know, treated me like I was a second or whatever. You know, everything he did, I did. You know. Okay, little question. How are you not bitter? Because I don't see bitter at all. I see a man of... God didn't want me to be bitter. Okay? God didn't want me to be resentful. God wanted me to learn from this. And oh God, I did. And um, I can't be bitter because I'm so grateful. I know a lot of people that went to prison when I went to prison and never got out. They died in prison. God said, I'm going to bring you through this. And I'm not bringing you through this without a reason behind mm. it. I'm bringing you through this because I want you to see something. Mm. Because where I'm going to take you to, where I'm going to allow you to go, mm. is going to be bigger than what you thought. Mm. Uh, one of the writers that actually initiated this thing with me, Sheila Ellis, mm. see, understand something. I knew nothing about show business. Okay. Oh, I'm learning rapidly, though. Yeah. <laughs> but I knew nothing about it. And one of the guys that um, worked uh, with uh, Judge Mathis, Greg Mathis, uh, his name is Reno. Mm -hmm. Reno told me, he said, Mr. Morris, let me tell you something. The entertainment business is more cutthroat than the drug game. Absolutely. Okay? And Absolutely. I didn't know this, you know, at the time. But like I said, I'm learning. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of that, it was at night. Let me look at that. 2017, a gentleman called my niece in Arizona, called Nicole, and told her that uh, in the Chicago newspaper, they said, some people are making a movie about your uncle. And what happened was, this guy, his name was Noel Robinson. You don't know him, but you know his brother. His brother's Reverend Jesse Jackson. And uh, Noel Robinson and I, he, who was actually a friend of my father's, uh, we were at a couple of places together. He's at home now, God bless his heart. And uh, was a very, in my estimation, a very good man. So um, this is when I first heard about high speed. Okay? 
And according to the newspaper article, he made his direct copy and sent it to my niece, my niece sent it to me. Courtney B. Vance was supposed to portray me in this movie, you know, and they had some other guy, Dwayne Johnson Cochran, who was producing it or something, not to be confused with Dwayne Johnson and Rock, you know, somebody else entirely different. But um, my counselor allowed me to call this guy, Dwayne Johnson, and this is Armin Moore. You never met me, but I'm sure you know who I am. So he talked for about three or four minutes. Said, well, we're putting the uh, move, we're shelving the project for now. Okay. So as time went on, uh, MTV, some other thing, Paramount, whatever. And so about maybe six, seven months ago, they started filming High State 88 in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And Angela Bassett, uh, his wife, had come into the film and picture, seen her name. You know, it's all over. It's all over the internet. You can look it up yourself if you care to. And so, my attorney here, Mr. Damon Moore, no relation, but um, he sent a couple of emails to him, wanting to know, hey, what are you, you know, my client, you know, right. about doing his story, versus even having me come sit on set for clarification purposes, yeah, yeah. as far as scenes or stuff. Um, because they had billed High State 88 as a true crime story. They put the correct amount, $70 million out there. They advertised my name for five years or over, Armin Moore. And uh, they changed the lead character's name to Jeremy Horn. They changed the dollar amount from 70 million to 80 million. And now they're billing it as based on a true crime story. Oh, Notwithstanding really that is. fact, just two weeks ago, Ms. Thomas sent me a thing that they had put out with uh, Courtney B. Vance's picture on one side and a picture of that book on the other side. Wow. All the way down. And periodically, when they do articles on it, they still mention my name. Yes. So, um, <laughs> is that not recourse? Like, yeah, well, my okay. name, my name is trademarked, and okay. my, my book is copyrighted. Okay, Goodness. so um, we're uh, we're looking into this it. Okay. I spoke with this other lady. She said, "Well, they do that all the time. It doesn't make it right to kept black folks in slavery for four hundred years, so uh, that you know that uh, that doesn't matter to me." So um, I'm learning, okay. But the thing, of course, it's the money. But the thing that is really more egregious, more of a slap in the face to me, you people are millionaires. You people, the money that you all are pouring into this movie, you're going to make a lot of money off of it. Mm -hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. And you would rather do these falsehoods. You would rather perpetuate these lies. You would rather turn your back on someone who you're actually using to do this than to give them a dime. But you're Hollywood's darlings. Okay, so uh, I'm black, y'all black. Of course, you all know that because you're stealing my story. And, you know, that, 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 that's it. For me, it even goes deeper than that. You had to walk this out. Mm -hmm. Like you literally, this is your life. And for someone to just, they can just, well, let's just get a camera and some lights and do somebody else's life and not give them credit. That's crazy to me. Well, you know, the, uh, Freeway Ricky Ross that uh, did the foreword for that. That's exactly what John Singleton did with his snowfall. That story is about him. Wow. You didn't know that? No. Yes. Well, you know, they were uh, putting some stuff together. I don't know what became of it. They were trying to steal Mike Tyson's story and do it. So you can literally be living in somebody can act like you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, you can still be, it'd be different, you know. If you were no longer with us, but you're with us, then they can move. You know, you here's, the, here's the thing. After you can't get myself copyrighted. I know somebody want to be me. Oh, yeah. I already know it. You're, I really know it. Trademark you. Like Copyrighted in the material. <laughs> but, uh, you know, one person asked me, they said, well, um, would you be satisfied if, like, if they gave me $500,000? I, I said, well, you know what, that would really be nice, but I keep my American Express card with me so I can take care of lunch. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, I was watching 
this little bio thing. The uh, actor that passed away a couple of years ago, uh, John, um, what's his name? The guy from Friday's played the father, Witherspoon. Oh, Witherspoon. Okay. Witherspoon said on the first Friday's movie, mm -hmm. they paid the actors $5,000. I heard it was a very small amount. Yeah. And they said that, he said that the movie cost $2 million to make. They said that Ice Cube was going to put the $2 million up, but he said Interscope told him, no, don't worry about it, we'll take care of it. And so they put the $2 million up. The movie made over $300 million. Okay? And guess how much money they turned around and gave the actor? Nothing. Not a dime. You know, so well, who uh, would have been on the hook to pay that though? Would it have been Ice Cube or would it have been no? The the, thing, once they they settle on a figure, then you settle on the figure. That. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, so, but uh, you know, that, 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 that was it. But uh, trust and believe, uh, I'm going down uh, kicking and screaming, you know. Please. I'm not, I'm not, I, like I, I told some other people, I don't recall receiving a letter or a Christmas card or anything from Angela Bassett or uh, her husband, Courtney B. Batch. I don't recall them ever coming to visit me or anything else. Now, Diane Sawyer actually sent a few people to visit me. Really? Yeah, she did. Nice. Uh, sent me uh, some letters and cards and stuff, pictures, which they're on my phone. Uh -huh. So, but, uh, and you don't get more wider than Diane Sawyer. Well, not at all. Not at all. So, but uh, <laughs> this, this is one of the real things. Okay? These are black people screwing over other black people. That is, that is you know? so wild to me. And uh, let me tell you something. I'm really not mad at Courtney B. Vance. I'm really not mad at uh, 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 Angela Bassett. I think both of them are fabulous actors and stuff. But how can you, in all good faith, do this to another black person? And you're, you're, you're standing to make millions and millions, which you already had millions and millions of dollars. And Let not me even play devil's advocate. I'm okay. gonna play devil's Please. advocate really, really quick before, before we wrap. Is it a chance that they don't know? Okay, I just asked. I'm just, like maybe they think everything is taken care of and it's not. No, okay, we just gonna do this. <laughs> I mean, is it a chance? Like, you know, it, it, they think it's taken care of, and they think the paperwork is in order, and they think that you're okay, and they're just doing No, that's not a chance. No, not a chance in hell. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing out there. <laughs> I just thought I was doing out there. Y'all know what the devil's acting like. But why is it a thing? They know better. Their, 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 their lawyer never even responded to my lawyer's emails. Oh, wow. Uh, so they oh, know. Of course they so know. They know. When, for five years, you advertised my name. So they know your name, so that's what you Oh, that's right. I tried. I tried. Yeah. I tried. And then two weeks ago, you're going to put out advertisement with the a copy book? of my book next to your face. And the teenager still trying to give them an out. Ain't that something? I ain't doing right. Yeah, so, no. And uh, I don't care what it takes, whatever. As long as God keeps life and breath in my body, I'm going to fight this. Every and I sincerely hope that I can get some attorneys to join in with my attorney and fight this to the bitter end. Because I mean, you're not the only one that has have dealt with it or is dealing with their yeah. story being told without them telling it themselves. Exactly. Right? They have, they, they have the right to creative writing and all this stuff, you know, where they can say, well, you know, I want to write a thing about, you know, this sign or whatever. And they can say, well, you know, this, that, blah, 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 blah. But when they say, well, I want to, Say something about this sign, but this sign belongs to you. Right, it actually okay. says right. what it says, literally. And yeah. uh, then that's that's different. That, yeah. That, that, that's entirely different. And, like, one of the things, like now, this is not my entire focus. It's a big part of it, but it's not my entire focus. I am focused on uh, trying to do what I can do to help the homeless. Yes. I'm trying to focus on what I can do for prison reform. Giving back. Yes, because my personal belief, mm -hmm. as far as prison is concerned, you have people there that had no business being there in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. The second thing is you have people that are there that are there serving far more time than what they actually should have gotten. Mm -hmm. In the feds, if you're not willing to give somebody up or something like that, they're going to talk how they did me. And they 
I got like 20, 25 years of unindicted enhancements. And then the Supreme Court overturned that and said, well, no, y'all can't do that. Oh, but the the ones that uh, already got screwed by this, y'all all right, y'all can keep it. So it was never made specifically retroactive for habeas review. If it had been, I would have been home 15 years ago, 18 years ago. But uh, they, they, they simply didn't care. Okay. I'm a huge uh, person of making sure we not only give back, but we say something to encourage a listener, a, a, a young person, a black person, a white person, whatever, Some, somebody dealing with depression, mental illness, whatever the case may be. Can you give us some closing thoughts, some closing words, and look that way? Um, what I truly and honestly believe in my heart of hearts Everyone has the ability to be someone. It all depends on what it is that you want out of life. No one can want something for you. If you don't want it for yourself, trust me, you're never going to get it. And no one owes you anything. Okay? Get out. Make a way for yourself. You may do things that um, you don't care to do. You may not want to work at McDonald's or you may not want to work at Burger King. But if it's the best that you can do right now, work there, okay? Because you will uh, go up, you will exceed. But one of the other things, surround yourself with people that, as much as you can that know a little bit more than you know and that have a little bit more than you have. Because if you surround yourself with the people that are on the same intellectual plane that you're on, on the same financial plane that you're on, you're never going to move. You'll be exactly where you are. You will be stuck. Okay? You have a brilliant mind. Use that brilliant mind, you know, more than just, you know, uh, learning uh, rap songs or this or that or, you know, giddy bopping around the neighborhood or something. You, especially if you're young. You have your entire life ahead of you. Okay? Do something with your life. Be somebody. You're already somebody. You just don't realize it, you know, or what to do. Okay? Hey, so, But... Uh, Thank you all so very much for having me. I really appreciate it. You know, it's been wonderful. I hope to see you all again. You know? I'm so and, excited. Uh, I'm so excited and proud of you. And God bless you all. God bless you. Give it up. I'm the boy. In the building. In the building. The ice that shook the nation. 70, 69 million, 400 million. 750. Okay. That's <laughs> Get this book. It is on Amazon. I will make sure I put the link on my page. You guys need to make sure. Is it a bestseller yet? Uh, on Amazon, we have 4.7 stars on mm -hmm. Nice. Let's make this a best. Let's make this a bestseller, y'all. It's worth it. This man is out here doing fantastic things. He's dealing. He, he has a past like we all do, but he's making it work. And it's still, I know the homeless, he's doing so many things, so many things. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I wish we had more time. I know, right? Jeez. But you know what? We have a two for one today. We normally just do one interview in one mm -hmm. day. But we have this guy, I don't know if you know his name, is Kenny Green. Is that okay? Yes, we've talked uh, a couple times. On the phone. Yes. He's got this whole name like Kenny Cash or something. I'm like, what? You talking about my name, Kenny Cash? Uh, <laughs> he's Kenny Green. He's here. Yes. This man, the Diamond District, okay. Bronx, 47th Street, out there making big things happen. We're going to talk to him next. How about that? Kenny, you want to come over here and we want to. Move arm in and get you in here right there. You want some tea? I got you some tea. Well, I don't drink the cold tea. I drink the hot tea. You got a cold tea. You know what I'm saying? It's my show, Kitty Cash. You got to drink cold tea. How are you doing, sir? I'm all right. How are you? I am blessed. And it's I a pleasure. It's it a is pleasure. indeed a pleasure. Yes, it is. Yes, you guys yes. having a good time with this? I'm having a great time. Yeah. I'm really having a ball with this. Kenny Green. Now, Kenny Green has, and it's so it's so cool because you guys' stories are. Um, when you mentioned uh, being mad, mm -hmm. and a lot of things that he talked about in his documentary had a lot to do with the hip hop industry, right? And that whole thing. So let's break this down a little bit. Like, what's Kenny Green? What's that? The Diamond District, 
Give us high overview, first of all, of this documentary and what exactly the Diamond District, what is, what is that? Break it down to us. The Diamond District is a documentary that me and my you know, fellow friends worked on. It's uh, currently on Tubi. You can watch it. It's about eight gentlemen infiltrated uh, industry and helped shape hip hop and jewelry culture. And um, for people that don't know, 47th Street is one of the richest blocks in the world, close to Wall Street. It's nestled between Fifth Avenue, and if you don't know New York City, you know Fifth Avenue. Mm -hmm. And you have Sixth Avenue, which is corporate America, then on the McGraw Hills, the different um, conglomerates mm -hmm. sit on Sixth Avenue. Mm -hmm. So in between that block, we were able to, uh, how you say, push our way in not be denied, do what we needed to do to create a lane. And um, once we was able to create financial means for some of the people there through, we connect to hoods all over the world, all over the neighborhood. And there was a financial gain and a relationship was formed. Mm -hmm. And we just, uh, you know, parlayed into other things and other things because even when you're in the diamond district, it's not just about jewelry. Mm -hmm. There's arms that spread out that other things can possibly happen because once people have relationships, especially with other cultures, it's not, in most games people play, street games, different things, not too many times cultures come together to benefit. Mm -hmm. In the diamond district, you have Russians, you have Jews, you have Turkish, you have Iranians, you have Blacks, mm -hmm. you have everybody. But usually the Blacks are part of the labor part, whether they're a polisher or something okay. like that. Mm -hmm. And um, us being young men, because I think I got out there in the um, 81, you know, and um, you know, that's right before that crack era and everything. Mm -hmm. And you know, young people, man, we trying to have money, you yeah. know, and it wasn't a lot of lanes open. Mm -hmm. So if we found a lane, you know, we was gonna try to push our way in there and stand up in it, you know what I mean? But what we had to understand too, is where we were. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't come so hood-like. Mm -hmm. We had to, um, like cop might say, look, man, you're going to be here. Don't come like that. Mm -hmm. So it was like, you was accepted. Do it like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So then when people came to deal with us, we might have to say, look, man, don't, it's too many of us. Just wait on the corner, yeah. you know, yeah. but don't, don't wait. Don't be so loud. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we, we know our people, you know what I'm saying? And, Wherever we go, we want things to adjust to that. Yeah. But it don't really work like that. You know so, I mean? Diamond District, it's a street uh, in Brooklyn. No, Manhattan. Manhattan, okay. Manhattan, New York City, Manhattan. So, in this Diamond District, they're known for all these jewelry stores and all these types of things, right? How do you come in to the Diamond District? Well, how, 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 well, how old were you? <laughs> well, what role did you play? The, the thing yeah. is this, right? Mm -hmm. What other way that a lot of these jewelers would have access to blacks, even the celebrities? And see, when you go to the late 70s, early 80s, hip hop doesn't, didn't exist like this. Mm -hmm. Gangsters and hustlers wore jewelry. And if you know it, for you to have a chain on your neck, you had to be okay not to be messed with on a level or you had to be able to, you know, handle yourself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So as time came, and most things, even now, everybody wanted to be like the hustler, the gangster. But they don't really know that world. Yes. They just think they do. Like he was saying, mm -hmm. everybody talk about prison. When you say, you've been there? Mm -hmm. It's a whole different, no, nah, you, you, you wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Because you wouldn't, look at it and glamorize it the way you might be doing. You know what I'm saying? Because it's serious business. Mm -hmm. So when um, I started going to 47th Street, and, you know, whether it's taking jewelry orders, and you just start learning other things. And, and you know, 
me and my man Big Black, you know, we sometimes have to lean a little bit to collect money from another jeweler to get to another jeweler. Yeah, yeah. And then um, my man Cook passed away, God bless him. He was able to speak eight, nine languages fluently. Wow. So he would know if somebody's talking about us or what they get ready to do. And they're not expecting this black nah, guy to be doing all these things. I'm different. from like eight, nine languages fluent. Wow. Mm-hmm. Then we have one arm up. Okay. You know what I'm saying? We got Terminator and uh, Brother, you know, my man Money Russ. Me and him collaborate now doing um, little stories and stuff. But I, I want to just acknowledge my man Ken Miles. He um, shot and edited the film. Okay. And this was a beginning journey for both of us because we never did this. Mm-hmm. So Ken Miles, shout out to him. And um, it's just really showing how young black men were able to infiltrate, hold position, benefit off relationships until this day we're still represented there. You know what I'm saying? To this day. You guys uh, talk, both of you guys, I'm glad you're still here. Uh, I don't know if you're in frame or not, but they can hear you. Mm -hmm. You guys both talk very passionately about relationships. I don't know if you guys realize that in conversation. That's what everything is. In today's climate, it is very difficult to find true, true friends, true, true relationships in today's climate. Your your relationship that you guys have spoken about, you've had these relationships 30 and 40 years. Have you? Or or longer? Ago. Ago. (laughs) Ago. Ago. I got you. Yeah. Okay. I just got out of a relationship, okay. and uh, the young lady, if she was a young lady, that I was with, I just felt, and this is why you can't want something for someone else, I just felt that she could do a whole lot better than what she was doing. Okay. Uh, so I lavished her with a lot of things. Uh, a lot of designer things, this and that, and um, uh, the old saying goes that you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. True, true. Okay. And uh, one of the last things I got her, I got her a BMW SUV, which I'm paying for. The, the, the truck was for her to get a job, go back and forth to work. And help take care of her daughter, okay. Which I was doing mostly, most of the taking care of her daughter. She thought it was for. Anyway, she wasn't my biological daughter, but I looked upon her as if she was, and still do. You know, the old saying was, "God don't like ugly." Uh, the internet didn't exist when I went to prison, so I'm still having. I got an iPhone 14 Pro Max. And I'm still having trouble, you know, <laughs> doing things on it. And I'm just sitting there playing on Facebook and stuff like that. 14 pictures pop up Uh-oh. of her and her boyfriend riding around in the truck that I bought for her, uh, laying on his bare chest, you know, her up in his arms and things like this. Okay. So God had sent me a few signs before, okay? So I guess he said, well, look, if you ain't catching up, I'm gonna just hit you over the head with a hammer. This is what's happening, okay? And so um, uh, that ended that, okay? And so this boyfriend that she had posting all the, well, I'm gonna take care of her. Uh, he didn't help her pay any of those car notes or nothing after that, because I stopped doing it. I think and every turn as well. I think everything is levels. And sometimes you can't take people to places that exactly. you mm-hmm. might feel like, man, I, I want to introduce you to this. Yes. I want this for you. Yes. You know what I mean? Because sometimes they'll even resent you yep. and look at it the wrong way when you just trying to give them a different level. Yep. You know what I'm saying? That you mm-hmm. might have felt they can handle or you know you wanted them to live in. You know, so I you know, I definitely understand it, but also there was another time when if you didn't respect a certain relationship, there was a penalty for it. Right now, 
whatever you do with people, there's really no penalty. You know what I'm saying? So if a person would worry like, no, nah, I don't want to mess it up with him. I don't want to mess it up with her because the penalty, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So now we in the culture, I can smile on your face, I can spit on you. And then, you know, I was, only, I was just bugging out. You know what it is? Mm -hmm. No. Nah. Nah. See, so it's too it's too much of that. Mm -hmm. And this is why people feel like they'll play on each other in ways that we can't even imagine. Does that go back to, you know, the young folks, and I have millennials children, but they'll say that's old school thinking. Well, is you know, it's just, but, but, this, but, but the thing you have to understand is just proper thinking. Mm. Like he said, correct thinking, mm -hmm. correct speaking. Mm -hmm. And if we don't police ourselves with mm -hmm. each other, everything is messed up. Mm -hmm. Because, it's because so bad now, right? There's no. Well, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. be, be, because, because, like he said, a lot of times people don't get caught. People tell on people. Exactly. People don't really get caught. Right, right, right. People tell on people. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so, you know, depending on you turn out to the life game, whether it's the streets, like, you know, that, you know, like, yeah, yeah. it's not an option to tell. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, whatever you have me with here, you give me that. That's it. But, you know, things are getting progressively worse, like over the last 15, 20 years, or even longer than that. I think one of the worst things that they did was when they, uh, Stop the uh, parents from chastising their children. Oh, okay. Okay. And of course, no one wants anybody to be abused. Mm -hmm. But I grew up in an entirely different culture. Your mother could just sit there and look at you. Uh, never had right, right. right. exactly. to open her mouth. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. 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 The thought would never occur to you to disrespect your mom. I'll call the police. But you know what? Exactly. One of the biggest problems now is men and women battle each other. And the kids play play that part of it. So even if we have indifferences, you know, there's certain things I'm never going to tell you. Don't listen to your mother, and she should never say don't, don't listen, listen to your father. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I think some women don't really understand. You can get a boy to a certain point, mm -hmm. but there's a rite of passage that young men and older men bond where. I'm going to take you through some things. You're not going to like me. You're going to feel I'm disrespectful. You're going to feel I'm hard on you. But then you're going to appreciate it because my job is to condition you. Yes. Not to play with you and be your friend. Mm -hmm. To condition you for what's next. Mm -hmm. So this is why sometimes, you know, I have so what we call some OGs that took me through things. Yeah. And, you know, I'm like, these dudes, man. Yeah, but yeah. I love them for it. You appreciate it now. I love them for it now. Just like my dad. Same yeah. things like this guy. Yeah, oh my yeah, yeah, yeah. goodness. Yeah. But when you see that you can survive through things easily, it's like yeah. it's nothing. Yeah. Because you was already conditioned for that. So I'm gonna ask you guys both this, knowing some of the things that you've done in your past. Okay. Switch it to your parents. What would you think of you? Just based on your past. Like I know good damn well I did not raise Kenny Cash like that. I know I did not raise Armin like that. What do you, what do you, what, switch it around. What, what well, I think, I think they probably would say, my goodness, man, you know, you could have got it. You know, sometimes you want the money. You want the money and you go in ways that they're not really understanding. And they looking at it like, but, man, if, you, if you're going to pay the cost for that, then you know, you, they just, you, you, you're your own person now. Yeah. You know, you just got to be willing to pay the cost and live in your choices. Mm -hmm. I remember in the late 70s, I was with a friend of mine and we were going to this woman's house to pick up some money. Mm -hmm. And something had happened with her son or something. And there were two or three unmarked police cars sitting around the house. And so as we exited the car, both of us had briefcases, portfolios. The police surrounded us. So they took my portfolio, his brief. They found a gun in mine. And so they took us to jail, and um, the people in the house actually called my sister's house and talked to my mom and told her what had taken place. So when I called from jail there, because I hadn't been there but about an hour or so, my mother asked me, she said, what the F are they messing with you about that for? That, that briefcase was in the uh, closet. I put my, that's my gun, that ain't yours. 
<laughs> that was my mother's line of thinking. Right, 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 okay? right, right. So um, in reference to this, when this case happened, I don't know if you came up or if you ever noticed, uh, the uh, minister, Louis Farrakhan, his name is in my book. Did you see that? Okay, he's under the list of people who made a difference. They wanted to indict him on this case. Really? Yeah. Why? Because in some of our phone conversations, they heard me talk to Reverend, this person, that person, and this, and they said that um, they believed that he might or that he do or was part of it. And they told me if I would take the stand and say that he would, they would completely drop all this against me, put me in witness protection. And said, because no. he's the big fish. Of course. Of course. You know what no, I mean? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that. You know, why would I do that in general? That's what you people do, lie on people to get them incarcerated and put them in prison. I'm not doing that. One of my co-defendants from the second case was one of the officers that worked at the MCC Chicago. And uh, they said the same thing. Well, if you'll take the stand and say that this guy was involved in this, uh, we'll uh, knock 15, 20 years off your sentence. Oh I told, they took me into court. The judge asked me, did your attorney discuss the government's proffer offer uh, uh, concerning your cooperation? Yes, he did, Judge. Have you made a decision concerning that? Yes, I have, Judge. Would you advise the court of your decision? I'd be more than happy to, Your Honor. I just assume murder my own mother, have sexual intercourse with her dead body, and cooperate with you apostles of Satan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was less than wow. taken with what I had to say. Wow. You know? So, uh, you know, uh, 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 train. Yeah, give him a drink. I need to sip on it. That was a lot. That was a lot. <laughs> but that's usually, you know, what the negotiation is. And like he had said earlier, you know, when I was a young man, I was like, okay, I've seen things happen with people. And so he has a lot of money. He probably was able to fight his case. Mm -hmm. But once you experience the battle system, you know, it's not, that's not how it goes. Mm -hmm. It's basically about some cooperation. Exactly. That's the financial to get out, the cooperation. That's right. And that's the part why when I asked you, how do you not be bitter? I, I, do not, I, I am not bitter and at the risk of being redundant. I am not bitter because when I was gone from the first day I came in until the last day <coughs> that I was released, I leaned on my faith. I leaned on God. And I realized that God had protected me. He wanted me to go through that. Mm -hmm. He wanted me to see it. He wanted me to learn. Because if that had not happened, I would have never met you. If that had not happened, I'd have never met him. I'd have never met Linda. I'd have never met him. And yeah. the story still unfolded. Okay, exactly. Yeah. The story still yeah. unfolded. So yeah. I think you have to remember that because sometimes we know what we've done and what we tried to do. Mm -hmm. And even if we got over penalized, because you got to remember, don't look for these people to play fair because they feel you wasn't playing fair. And that's how they're going to look at it. Well, shit, you want us to be fair. Figure your way out. He went to the law library, did what he did. Not only did he figure some things out, he figured things out for other people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even like now with my diamond district group, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes you're living something and you don't realize the impact or the influence. Mm -hmm. I didn't look at these eight guys, what we did, mm -hmm. how we was able to parlay relationships, bring hood people to Jew people, mm -hmm. vice versa, and spend a lot of money. You know, like mm -hmm. I said, my man Monk introduced Jay-Z to Jacob the Jewel. And we know what the relationship is after yeah. that. So it's, it's a lot of that, that, you know, it's, it's over, it's over. But we still here, we still have certain contacts. And it's just sometimes good for to showcase that when a group puts, the, puts themselves together, in a unified stance, mm -hmm. it's hard to move. You made a mention in your documentary, and I, you know, I kind of brought it up to you because I thought it was hilarious. Uh, business is business. Uh, well, I had business point, right? is business. Now, I'm like, wait a minute now, what does that mean? Business is well, business. Well, in the documentary, I had a friend. Uh -huh. He needed some financial help. <laughs> so I extended him a favor, but I took some collateral his watch, right? <laughs> and 
I said, look, man, you know, you got X amount of days. And he said, all right, cool. So I reminded him, like, yeah, look, you know, that's due tomorrow. He was like, I'm bothering him. All right, so, you know, I take it on the chair. A few days later, I let the deadline go over a few. I said, look, man, what we doing? Yeah, yeah, I'm like, I, you know, I said, okay. I said, keep remembering, this is business. Because we have a personal relationship where we do things, but this is business. Right. This is, I said, listen to this. So I said, I said, okay. I say something to him. God, man, I told you, man, about. All right. I got you. Yes. I sold it. I sold it. <laughs> so he called me days later, a couple weeks later. Hey, Ken, I got that. I said, nah, man, that's gone. He said he hung up the phone. He couldn't believe me. Yo, you really sold my shit. I said, it's gone, man. I told you. So he, we didn't speak for a while. And then I guess when he came to the realization and started playing with face, he kept saying it was business. He kept saying. And he had to own the fact that he didn't do what he was supposed to do. And I extended weeks after that. That's the friendship. I extended weeks after that. Now, are you chumping me off? Yeah. No, nah, we're we not doing it. I wanted to talk about that a little bit, perhaps with the both of you. How do you separate business from, I don't want to say pleasure, but business from friendship? Like, how do you really like, separate? Like I was that? saying earlier, there's so, some friends. Once you give them money, don't expect it back. And you know that when you give it to them. Exactly. Don't need, because you be like, you know what? I'm going to help, but I already know I probably don't have nothing coming. They're going to tell you the greatest lie. And like they say, sometimes it's the insult to bring the weakest shit to the strongest person. Mm. You start See, telling me all good that. Line. I think that's my problem. I don't have no catchphrases. That's my problem. That's why I'm not able to move money like these guys move money. I don't know how to say catch stuff. Like cool stuff. I ain't got that sense yet. Because that's sometimes it. when you, when, like say, when you person that you engage in money, people start navigating to you, coming around. You. And there's some people you be like, I'm going to just let them have it. And some people say, Give me something to hold and I'll give you that. Mm -hmm. Because you know, that's the only thing that's going to keep us level. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I know you. And then you got to realize he's ahead of me. He's too far ahead of me. My mentality is going to be a problem. So let him go with that because he may have to come back. How do you guys discern between good folks and bad folks? Well, one of the things that, uh, tell, I'm like this. I don't have uh, a great deal of people that I consider as friends, okay? okay? But see, I'm this type of person. Mm -hmm. if, if, if he's my friend, if you're my friend, she's my friend, and all I have to do is know something, okay? Mm -hmm. You don't have to ask me. You activate it. Okay? Mm -hmm. I'm going to make sure, if I know your lights are about to be cut off, your lights ain't getting cut off, okay? And I'm not going to put you in the position of having to ingratiate yourself right. upon me, you know, for that. Now, if I know that you had the money to pay your life bill, but you decided to get high or go to the club or something, that's something else entirely that's different. That's a different conversation, right. yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, but um, everyone does not reciprocate. Now, I, there's people that I know that knew me from when I went to go do my 30, mm -hmm. stuff like that, when I came home, okay? Didn't offer a dime. I mean, common sense dictates if someone's been out of the picture for 30 years, there's probably a few things that they need. Right. <laughs> and they don't have to come around and ask you. Then you common sense dictates this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when they do absolutely nothing, then they've done a lot because they've revealed themselves. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And wow. that's, that's when it comes wow, in wow, again, wow. living your choices. Because okay. if I come home yeah. and you don't offer me nothing, it's yeah. fine. Because we all grown people. It's right, fine. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But now if my numbers go like this mm -hmm. and you're like, yo, da, 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 no, we're not going to do that. Let's uh -huh. not even play like it's okay. And I'm not mad. We just can't do that like that. And that's what I'll be saying about a lot of people now. They'll tell you the greatest story. Yo, I didn't know, man. Da, da. You knew of course, you know. So let's not insult me. You, you know. Don't do that. But it's okay to be, like he said, nobody owe me nothing. But if you do something, it's respected here. 
you. You know what I'm saying? That's where we fuck. It's respected here. You know, you didn't have to do nothing. What if they said, I didn't have no money to give you, but I was praying. That's what I'm saying. I was praying for you, though. No, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then, like, but, you know, <laughs> then, like, when, when they come around uh, to me uh, and ask me for something, I said, well, I don't have anything to give you, but I will pray for you. Right, exactly. Because you know what? You get you what give you the same energy. No, you get what you get. Exactly. You get what you get. When people, well, after I came home after 30, 30 years, <coughs> not 30 days, not 30 months, yeah. 30 years, man, you know, I was just thinking about sending you some money now. What? Talk, 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 talk. You understand? Yeah. Exactly. I see. No, you weren't thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I was going to write you a letter. So, you had 30 years. I had, one of my co-defendants got out and did well, and he had a tax problem. Now, these people understand only served two years, two and a half years. I served 30, okay? So they were in the system. They know you need money to go to the commissary. Right. They know you need money to use the telephone because they were there. Now, some people on the streets are totally oblivious to that. Yeah. My sister, well, don't they give you everything that you need? I'm asking you to send me my money, exactly. not yours. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah. he, he, you know, here's, here's the thing. Yeah. You're in a situation to where as, you know, uh, when some, and, and it's insulting to me when you can sit there and look me in my face after 30 years, never saw you one time, never came to visit, uh, never sent a card, never sent a dime. And then said, well, we love you. Yes, I know. But I see the that every line day. is I didn't want to come see you like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, I didn't want to come see you like that. But but that's the, the truth, truth though. Like, what if that's really the truth? Like, I would freak out if I had to go to a jail. Like, well, I could well, go in one time and well, but, freak but me this out, is, right? but, but this is what you have to understand. What would you want me to do if you was in that situation? Okay, but you know what? You know what's really up under that? Like what he just said. I don't want to see you like that. They. That's true. They really don't. But you know why? Because that would reinforce in their mind that you need help. That you need, uh, uh, you know, this and that or because, something, yeah. because they're seeing it, yeah, yeah, yeah. hearing it, and actually knowing about it in the back of their minds is one thing. Mm -hmm. Once they sit there and see it face to face, then you know there's no. Right, so this, is, this is what people got to understand. Usually, the state jails are different than the federal jails. Oh God, yes. In the federal jail, you do not get anything. You have to pay for everything. Mm -hmm. So you have to pay for a phone call. You have to pay for different food. You have to pay for everything. So, I guess to whoever's listening, yeah, people might need your help. People may need your help. They might need your help. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, this is a uh, a Diamond District T-shirt. This is my crew. You know, these are on Amazon too. So yeah, you know, sure. like that. And a lot of times, a lot of people outside of New York probably not familiar. So watch the Diamond District on Two B U Good Building, and also on YouTube. I put we have a soundtrack. Uh, called the Diamond District soundtrack. Uh, you got different singers, heat makers, arsonists, uh, you know, different people on the track, Joel Ortiz. And I'm doing short little movies based on the soundtrack. So one is dropping today on YouTube. Uh, it's under um, the Kenny Queen YouTube. Yeah, there you go. It's uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so that's what it is. But like I said, there's a lot I can say about it. I go. told you I had it. Just gonna listen to a little bit. I don't know how people hear how you is. This is joint. Yeah, let that rock out. <laughs> let that rock out. <laughs> Exactly. Like exactly. you said, if you not, had not gone through what you've gone through, I wouldn't be sitting there. Right. And you got, I wouldn't be this and honored you, to have and, you guys. And sometimes here. there's a certain level of knowledge, discernment, and, and there's something about you that you can lead now. Mm -hmm. You can help. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because, mm -hmm. because I'm always concerned with what and who's coming behind. Yeah. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Mm -hmm. So you try to do things to articulate because. 
I was 20 something before. Yeah. I know the mindset. Mm -hmm. When you want some bread, you want some money, I know the mindset. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, the only person that might could relate to that person is somebody that was that person. Because they're always telling you, oh, if you go to school, if you just do this, look, man, look, 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 man. Yeah, you're, not, you're not even understanding. Yeah, yeah. When, when you're looking at it going, I got to feed my kids, or I got to have some but, 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 but sometimes, But sometimes, it's just you don't know no other way. You just don't know no other way. This is normal. Like he said, his mother taught him how to speak like that. That's normal. Mm -hmm. So you know how difficult he thought, like, yo, what up, what up? Uh -huh. It's going to be corny. It's going to be awesome. It's, it's just not. Right. So now it's you different. come up, yo, look, you can buy three of these quarters. You can turn that into seven. You can pay your bills. And get you some shit. Uh, As a poor man, go ahead and give me seven dollars now. And they're going to talk shit. Wow. You know, because a lot wow. of people go into these job markets. Because we know, yeah, you know oh, what I'm yeah. saying. Mm -hmm. Subliminally, yeah. do little things. Yeah. And everybody's character is not good. My character is not built for that. Yeah, I uh, you know. Because you have some of the old heads that'll say, "Just go get a job." You they ain't got to be out there selling. But they're just they're, 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 they're just else. trying to help you based on the level they know. They don't know what else to say. Because that was their reality. And it's no, not no, 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 no. They don't know what else because they know they didn't go get a job at 23. Mm. They didn't do it. Mm. But they need to say something. But what else could they say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? If you're not, if you're asking somebody to stop something, you have to fill it with something else. Mm. That's good. That's real good. That's real good. Right. Instead of just saying, well, and that, and that comes in, yeah. or that's like right there. You got to make mm -hmm. He's making some money. You get ready to get a victim. Mm -hmm. Another man is saying, look, man, I like your style, man. I can clear up your mess real quick. Gotcha. You're going to have to entertain it. Yeah. That's right. You're going to have to entertain it. Yeah. And if you don't, you're going to be That's hungry. real talk, man. People ain't ready for that conversation right there. But guess what? They ain't ready for that one. If you wait for people to get ready, especially our people, ain't nothing going to happen. So you put it there, those that'll take it and take it. That, those that won't. You said that earlier, right? Use mm -hmm. what you can use the rest of it, throw it away. Yeah. Some people are just because some people are just like now I'm gonna go now I'm not even a, a Bible reader none of that. God said, Joe, look man, I'm gonna give you the game. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Get your folks, you y'all go. Do not turn around. Let them do not turn around. Nobody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. You turn around. You're gonna be salt, man. It's not right. Yeah. So what's the difference? Right. What's the difference? Wow. You gotta look at it like that sometimes. I'm, I'm just, believe it or not, I'm almost speechless. And you guys haven't known me that long, so for me to say I know, I'm speechless, I know Tony T and speechless. Right, exactly. <laughs> <Somebody brought four. laughs> I, what, I, what I'm enjoying about this is the realness of it. We're having a real conversation, raw perspective. Raw YouTube, perspective. Like Kenny that. Green, raw perspective <laughs> on YouTube. Check that out. Period. Oh, while we had it. But you know, like like but like Amar said it, right? We spoke a few times before this is our first time seeing each other. Oh, okay. Cool. But we spoke a few times and automatically I was compelled when I heard the story because it's another robbery taking place. Yeah. And we hold mm. the answer to the best answers in the family courts we hold them here. Yeah. Yeah. About integrity too. When we yeah. look at them, we see black integrity, black excellence. Mm -hmm. This is why what's happening in his story cannot happen. And they might need help saving themselves. Yeah. Because it wouldn't be a good move for them. So like I told you, not to, hey, hey, because like you said, maybe they above the food chain, they don't know. Yeah. They know. Yeah. They know. Yeah. See, and, and sometimes, you know what we gotta stop doing? Giving each other the excuse. Uh, out. That out. excuse out. Story. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And just like Linda just showed me the book, Courtney Vance, this, that. Come That's on, we gotta stop. Mind, we gotta yo. stop. So rather than trying to smother him, it's too easy to say to make to make the story better and more authentic, put him on board. Do you think they have a mind? I can't speak for them, I don't know what they But do you think it could be of the mindset when you said indigenous? 
You know, when people go and they be gone for a long time, and it don't matter. We can do what we want to do to him. No, I think they accept, some of the, they accept some of the Hollywood, like, look, we ahead of him. He's not in a position to fight. That's what I mean. So, like, it, it doesn't so, matter what he thinks. So, so, play it for But that's why I said, I would generally knock on his door. Hey, look, y'all, 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 y'all stealing? <laughs> make, make it clear to me. Are y'all stealing from me? I like y'all. Yeah. I hold y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all wouldn't be stealing from me, yeah. right? I, I don't see y'all like that, but help me understand. Yeah. Now, now, and my thing is, once my conversation starts paralleling that movie and it's bringing doubt, and it's like people start questioning, either you go ahead and say, yeah, would they do that? Now there's a cloud over the movie. A cloud over them. Yeah, exactly. As well. When is this movie supposed to come out, you know? That I don't know, but I know they were filming in I don't even know if they're finished filming it or not. The so only this thing is that I, like, right, this is like, I think, yeah, this, this is going on right now. This is fluid. It's, it's moving. And uh, I don't know what the hell they were thinking because my lawyer made it quite, quite clear. My client's name is trademarked. The book is copywritten. Okay. You're going to infringe upon those things and then turn around and slap me in the face too. Uh, oh, we're going to war. I'm not going to go. It's too easy to bring them on as a consultant. Exactly. Please. That's what I'm like. Why, why aren't you there? And it just right. Who knows my story better than me? Why you lived it? Exactly. Yeah. And exactly. the only thing that they had to work with were court documents, and they figured they'd fashion a story around the court documents. I am the story. Get me on camera, dude. Yeah, that's what I'm Diamond about. District. Diamond District. Period. Let me make sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Listen. It's Courtney Dance, Angela Bassett. Do the right thing, man. Mm-hmm. And let's just pretend y'all don't know. No, we're not going to pretend. Okay, all right, all right. Let's see that. We ain't even going to let you pretend you don't uh, know. It's yeah. a Southern thing in me. Nah, well, I'm nah, a crazy baby, you know. <laughs> Angela Bassett. <laughs> Courtney B. Vance, do the right thing. Because if you don't know, now you know. Yes, for sure. But it's going to be either. It's turning into a series. They're doing a whole series on this? Or is it just one movie? Well, from what I understand, people oh. in, that were in my camp wanted to do a series. They wanted to do a mini series. Okay? Uh, some conflict has arisen out of that. Uh, because what was what they wanted, well, what 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 was supposed to have been done was actually take ninety percent of my story and give me ten percent, and then I was being told, "Well, I'm giving you more than what Courtney B. Vance is giving you." No, you're not going to give me anything. You can keep that, and I turned my lawyer loose on it. So now documents are being hidden and well, I don't know where they are and this and that and so forth. So I'm, you know, like I said, I knew nothing about the entertainment business, but I'm learning now. But I, like I said, I was told, you know, uh, by this guy Reno who works with uh, Greg Mathis, the entertainment business is more cutthroat than the drug business. Now, I had a lot of friends that were in the drug business. I never was. A lot of them would come to me for advice and this and that and, you know, what to do with their money and so forth. And, um, but that was it. But, you know, part of the cutthroat part, right, it's just that the repercussions are carried out. Mm-hmm. Where in other businesses, people do things. Druggers, you took his money, you were not going to pay back. Yeah. It's carried out, the repercussions. Yeah. Right. Where now it's like, I'm ahead of you. I don't have to um, pay you, you know. Like, I don't know how true it is. Just like with, say, Lee Daniel got the money from mm-hmm. Damon Dash. Mm-hmm. Ah, I'm paying. I'm, right. you know. yeah. Because sometimes they look at you as, you basically a criminal. you scared of the police. You're not going to mess with me. Ooh. Right. But, you, you, but there's there's other. I methods. think that's in yeah. there. I think that undertone is there. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh. Yeah. And then they probably yeah. figure, hey, what, what does he mean? What does he mean? I mean but it's see, that. but what about. What is it worth? Mm-hmm. You understand? So the next people, they come to him and they talk about, I'm giving you a little more than Courtney Vance. Mm-hmm. How do you, see, you're already measuring me wrong. Mm. You're already measuring me with the wrong ruler. Mm. Mm. So now you're insulting me because you would use that measurement to approach me with a deal. 
And that measurement is wrong to the start. With. So, so this is the level of insult you deal with day to day with certain people. Yeah. And how much can you take it at? Yeah. Wow. The man did 30 for his. Yeah. He did 30 for his. Don't chump him off. You know, because what I've decided to do now, and I've actually spoke to Linda about it, because uh, Linda wants to do a clothing line and a few other things for me. And um, I actually want to sell 20 or 25% of me to someone now because it, it, the, the, the money will go up exponentially. And because I have a myriad of things that I'm trying to get done now. And so even if I drop dead tomorrow, you're still going to get your money because these things are still going to roll on. And so uh, I don't like the idea. It, it's personally insulting to me what uh, Courtney B. Vance and Angela Bassett are doing. It's insulting. Okay. And to think, oh, well, uh, that's not Armin Moore anymore. That's Jeremy Horn. And you're standing up taking pictures next to my book. Okay. I mean, how stupid do you think the public is? How stupid do you think I am? You know, and you're, you're standing there smiling, taking pictures. Uh, we're Hollywood darlings and this and that. And you're trying to F me out of uh, everything that I spent 30 years in prison for. And, if, uh -huh. and if, if a person never speaks up, like when I talk about the Diamond District, Jacob the Jeweler, mm -hmm. me and Tito, mm -hmm. they'll probably never mention us. Mm -hmm. But we may mention them. Mm -hmm. So now when we tell our story, mm -hmm. and as people, since it's something people can't really even put their heads on mm -hmm. because this was able to happen in New York. Mm -hmm. when this couldn't duplicate itself no other place but New York. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So now, as I tell the story, which, which I don't understand, I don't understand. This is why we have to do episodes and we have to do things. To really and, show the real and story. And you'll see the origin. Yeah. That we're going to do the origin for how this even happened like this. Mm -hmm. Then you'll realize the greatness mm -hmm. in what was done. Mm -hmm. And you'll see eight young guys unified. And there was a guy, he got murdered by the police in South Carolina a few years ago, Ben. He's one of the only black guys out there that had a refinery. Oh, wow. Right. Mm -hmm. And whatever things happened in his life, he couldn't take it on. Mm -hmm. You know, things happened. But he guided us too. Nice. You know, because you 19, you said, you wow. But you, you guys know, are willing to listen, though. 19 year olds now, I don't. Man, well, like, you it's listen a different to time. It's, it's a different time. It's, 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 you know, it's a different They time. already, no, I get, I but we had, we, we, had, had, we had older dudes too that would check you. Yo, what you doing, shorty? Mm -hmm. Yo, nah, 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 nah. See, now old dude be scared. I want to ask you a question about that because I've always heard, especially in Chicago, that they actually, and correct me if I'm wrong, that they actually rounded up all of the OGs or, or the, 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 the uh, gang uh, leaders and they put them all in jail. That don't work. And then <laughs> they, they've done it. Like they don't but have that. Don't that I don't know what you would call it, but like the main guy that run the block, he ain't there no more. So now the kids are out there just, they don't have a direction. Jail and the street communicate. The streets and jail communicate. All the time. All the time. See, you, you have people that are in jail, uh, street people, mafia people, they still run everything just like they were yeah. right there. Okay. Because they already know what's that designed to do. So failed systems are put in place, look, man. Somebody come on a visit at once a month. If a person is big enough, you got cops bringing cell exactly. phones and stuff in to give yeah, them. Yes, I wonder how much, how all they get in there. You know, like and everybody hustling. Okay, exactly. Everybody hustling. Yeah. And you know what? This is what people got to understand when they looking at things and even in their life. Mm -hmm. This is a capitalist society we live in. Mm -hmm. Everything is about the money. Mm -hmm. No matter how you feel in your heart, spiritual attitude. This is capitalism. Mm -hmm. And decisions are going to be made based on profit. Mm -hmm. Not your feelings. Mm -hmm. Not always right and wrong. Mm -hmm. So even when you watch the news and you see certain things going on, capitalism first. Profit first. If you think about it like that, you might just see things different. You might understand things and not position yourself so you don't get your head hit. Mm -hmm. Expect it. It's Wow. T. Sippers, I don't know if you guys was ready for this one in the middle of the day. This has been a heavy, 
heavy, but educational, inspirational, deep conversation that we've had today. And I wish we had more time because I could, we can talk. We can talk I, I, I for we many more too. hours. I promise you. It's just so many different layers to you guys' past, mm -hmm. uh, your futures, your current. Um, how important is it to live in the now? It's, it's good. Um, without being too long and drawn out, I'll try to condense it as much as I can. <clears throat> and the little sunglass thing in the, 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 hood, the uh, roof of the car, mm -hmm. I keep money up there. People standing out with their signs and stuff. You know, I give them some money and stuff. About a month, month and a half ago, um, I was coming through. I just dropped a friend of mine off at the airport. And I was coming through the um, uh, 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 thing there at uh, Dunkin' Donuts, the uh, drive-thru. Right. And uh, there was a guy standing at the end there, like 26, 27 years old. He stopped me. He didn't ask for any money. He asked for a sandwich. He said he was hungry. I said, well, they got four or five different kinds of He said, I don't know. I stopped by myself. I said, get in the car. I drove back through there. He picked a sandwich out, whatever. I said, okay. I said, well, you take care. I said, while you're out here roaming around, you're going to pick out a shopping center. See all those help wanted signs? Probably do it with something to help you. I said, well, yeah, I know. Blah, blah. But he's talking about his problems at home, and I said, okay. So he said, which way are you headed? I said, I'm going down towards Six Mile Road. He said, I have a cousin that lives over there. Could you drop me off at his house? Sure. Come on. So we're three, four minutes. We're there. As we're pulling up, he said, I don't see his car. Let me see if, he, if his girl's got his car, if he's actually there. I'll let you know. I said, okay. He wasn't in the house one minute because apparently the cousin wasn't there. He came out. He said, my uncle lives around the corner. He said, could you drop me off around there? Sure. So I drove around the corner. So he's sitting in the car and he's telling me, and I, I don't like to be rude. You know, I'll sit there and I'll listen. About seven, eight minutes later, a, a black car pulls by me turns around and pulls directly in front of me, puts the little cop lights on. Then a car pulled up behind me. So I'm sitting there Black and I I, I, I I love situations like this. <laughs> like, you know, what the hell do you want? Right. So, but at any rate, the guy in the car in the front comes, opens the car door, takes the kid out, takes him to the back of the car, handcuffs him. Yeah, I'm just still sitting there. I know I hadn't done anything. Right. So, but what happened was the people in the back, the black guy and the white lady, the sheriff's departments, they come and they said, uh, can I see your driver's license? I know I'm under no obligation to show it to them because I haven't done anything wrong. But I gave it to them, not to be confrontational. Mm -hmm. like, ah, here. So he went back to his car, came back, came to me. He said, oh, okay, you're good. He said, uh, can I uh, uh, pat you down? What? I said, sure, you can pat me down. So I got out of the car. So the other guy that uh, was in the front car, he now got back and took the cuffs off the kid and came back to my window. He said, we're going to confiscate your car. <gasps> Any particular reason? You just have an open slot at the confiscation. <laughs> <car>. <laughs> right. So he said, there's drugs in your car. <gasps> really? Uh, sir, you didn't search my car. And neither did any one of these other officers. Uh, well, that place that you uh, uh, dropped him off at is a crack house. Well, if that's what you thought, you had the house under surveillance, why didn't you arrest him when he came out and right. or enter the house? Right. Did you think that illegal drugs were being sold there? Well, we don't have to do it, blah, blah, blah. So he gets on his phone and calls for a tow truck. The truck was there in like five minutes. And I've called for tow trucks before. You look at an hour. Exactly. Hour. Right. Okay. So the tow truck driver, I guess maybe it's that annoying man, I don't know. He, gave me, he said, call this number. I call the tow yard. He said, they've been taking cars over there all day long. They're doing stings and stuff. So the first thing I think, maybe they had this kid approach me, you know, the, set but up. set up. But it wasn't that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so clearly they didn't get any drugs off of him because they would have arrested him. Right. Right there in their own spot. They never searched my car, said it was none. So when I went to go pick my car up, because you can't even apply to get your car back for 30 days, because they said, well, we're going to try and forfeit your car. That ain't happening. So, but uh, I had to end up paying $1,350 what? to get my wow. car back. Then um, what happened, the people at the tow yard said, well, 
what did the courts do with the ticket they wrote you? So they never wrote me a ticket. You never got a ticket? No. He said, they're never supposed to touch your car without writing you a ticket. Yeah. Okay. okay. They did write a paper of telling me where I could go get my car and what it would cost, but no violation of law, none of this, none of this. So I went to the main office of the Sheriff's Department, downtown Detroit on Woodward Avenue. Uh, I'd like to speak with someone from Internal Affairs. And so the guy okay. came out and I sat out, I explained the whole thing. He asked me would I write it out. Yes, I did. He said he was going to pass it on. I said, can, can I get one of your cards? He gave me the card and stuff. And he actually followed called me back and this is did you get your car back? Yeah, I got, well, okay, I'm glad you got it back. The car was, was an issue, but it was not the issue. Number one, because uh, we, we were parked sitting on the side, you know, the street. And um, uh, he said that they, well, where, where, where is what they found? Okay, now if he, they saw him go in that house and come out, okay, then, you know, uh, right. that was an issue you all were supposed to have dealt with then and there. Not on, you know, not on me. Right. But um, then some people that I'm, well, see, that's what you get for stopping trying to help these people, blah, blah, blah. You but, can't be discouraged. Uh, no, oh, and, I, and I won't be. That's crazy. I won't be. Because in the city of Detroit, like a lot of other big cities, they have these extremely large old apartment buildings that are basically abandoned and stuff. The government will allow you to get these things. They'll renovate them and stuff and make a place for these people. A lady was going down the street a couple of weeks ago. She said, I've been to the Christian Center and everything, and there's no place. Now, uh, you know, I've had, well, that's not your problem. Well, no, you're right. It's not directly, but indirectly it is. But by the grace of God, that could have been me. Okay, that's out there. That's like that. So, you know, that's it. That well, crazy, let though. me just finish it off because what happens, like you said, you worry about the future, right? Because you, you think about now, a lot of people will talk about the present, you know, because that's all you have. But what if tomorrow comes? You know what I'm saying? And a lot of our culture, we con ourselves and say, man, I'm going to live my best life. I'm, I'm going to have a good time. But then the next month, you're asking for help from somebody that was thinking about tomorrow. And that's really unfair and insulting. So, you know, I think we just got to understand tomorrow comes live your best life today responsibly so that's kenny green for perspective <laughs> diamond district you know what i'm saying you know we're going to get more into that but raw perspective on youtube check it out diamond district on 2b check it out i'm enjoying myself with talking tea tell us how to get your information to follow you, um, support you, what do we need to do? I, well, Instagram, Instagram, yeah. Superfly Entertainment, Diamond District on Instagram and Facebook as well. Uh, I am on Facebook and I am on Instagram. And through my public relations uh, director, uh, Linda Thomas, uh, you can contact me. That's, that's not an issue. And by all means, go on Amazon. Get this book. I'm sure that you will enjoy it. Yes. Great book. It is a great, great book. book. And uh, one of the most important things outside the content that's in the book um, is the individual that one of the individuals that wrote the foreword for me. Because uh, you don't get too much bigger than this. Freeway Rick Ross. So uh, if he believes in me, then I know a lot of other people will as well. It's a good thing. It reads well. Yes. Really and I, I'm very pleased and thankful that you had me on the show. Very pleased and thankful to have been here with you, Kenny. And uh, God bless you. God keep you. You as well. Thank you. T. Sepper's listening. Go on and put your little Hennessy over in that tea at this point. I mean, you're already there. We're here. Put it in there. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're talking tea with Tika. Make sure you support these gentlemen. They're doing awesome things. I know you're helping the homeless, so we want to make sure we can contribute to that cause as well. Absolutely. So I'll make sure I post that information. Definitely look for more information, documentaries on this dude. I'm telling you, go on to me. It was, and I'm not really a documentary person, but I found myself like, no, what did Monk say? It was, <laughs> it was it's, it's really, really good. So I'm looking forward to seeing more stuff from Superfly Entertainment. So guys, listen, go back to work. I've had you guys for a couple hours now. Time to go back to work. Okay. Love you guys. Bye. Sip, sip.
You got people coming in 15 minutes, right? 3 o'clock. Oh, okay. Come in the stream. How many of you are going for? I think the residence is. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. okay.